Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the notification bell and subscribe to the channel, everybody, so you get these great interviews. Today I've got Rick Emmett, famous Rick Emmett of the band Triumph. How are you doing, Rick? I'm fine, Ernest. I'm great. How are you? I'm a million bucks shy of being a millionaire, and I think I said that the last time we talked. The old John Candy joke. <laughs> uh, before I get to... Uh, you, Rick, um, just got uh, somebody just sent something to me. I'm just gonna see what the heck this is. I don't want to waste your time. And God, they pack these things pretty good. Uh, there we go. Anywho, I wonder what this could be. Oh, it's a bunch of dust. Oh, there you there you go. <laughs> who is that young man? This is Laid on the Line, a backstage pass to rock star adventure, conflict and triumph. Conflict and triumph. I like to play on words. Rick Emmett. So this is your latest book, Rick. Um, I have obviously hadn't had a chance to read it, but I do know a bit about it. Uh, let the viewers know right away um, where they can get it, first of all. Uh, well, you know, it's a modern digital universe, so you, uh, you just kind of get your Google machine out and you go to Amazon and you know, you can probably find it there. It, it's out on ECW Press is the publisher. So okay. they would have it on their website. And you can probably go to your local bookstore. And if they don't have it, you should support your local bookstore anyways and say, hey, could you order that in for me from ECW Press? Uh, that song that, you know, that uh, book that has the song title, Lay It on the Line. What, <laughs> what, is, what a strange title to have chosen. Um, <laughs> anyhow, so yeah, you know, um, you can find it online, but um, yeah, that would be my choice that you buy it from a local bookseller. Yeah. And if they don't have it, like Rick said, threaten them. Tell them you're not going to purchase from them anymore. No more, uh, no more um, Indigo, no more chapters. But uh, anyways, you can get it at fine bookstores is what he's saying. So tell the viewers uh, basically the premise be behind uh, Laid on the Line. I, I kind of know the premise, but Let's say the Triumph fan out there who didn't realize you have a new book out because you're an author, um, not just in your first uh, kick of the can, you uh, released um, your poetry book. I, I don't mean to discount it, but is that, it was a couple of years ago, was, uh, was your book on poems? Yeah, Reinvention, and it was a book of poems. And I have another one that's in the can waiting to come out, but, you know, now we're doing the, the dog and pony show for the memoir, you know. Uh, and the reason I wrote it was not because I necessarily felt like I wanted to just add another rock star, you know, autobiography to the giant pile of them that exists. But um, I did want to try and do something a little different than what other folks do when they write theirs. And so mine's got 16 chapters and there's only one of them. That's the triumph chapter. It's only about 10 percent of the co of the content. The others are about the, like what the guitar has meant to me, what songwriting has meant to me, a lot about what my family has meant to me and right. what it's like to be a, uh, a father and a husband. Uh, a lot of stuff about um, the fact that I was a teacher for 20 years and mm -hmm. uh, the, the courses that I taught and what that experience taught me. Um, when you write a memoir, I think there, it's, a, it's a journey of, of self-education. You know, you're learning about yourself by going through the process so and in a sense you know I, I heard somebody say the other day you know oh every day's a school day and i i believe that's true like if you have the right attitude about life you're always looking to learn something so um i i felt like writing my memoir was a chance to you know try to solidify some things about me and one of the big things was that i realized sort of this moral thing that i have where uh, you know, there's a side of me that wants to be always creative, always wants to be at play. Right. But right. then that part of me, my my wants, my, uh, my needs, they can become kind of selfish and greedy. Yeah. And, and how much of your life is going to be lived so that you do it for the benefit of others. And so, you know, I write a song that's, it's kind of yeah. fun for me. It's kind of it, like, I like to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the song then has to go out to the public, it has to find an audience, you know. So there's that other side to every equation is how are you going to balance your kind of selfish greed <laughs> and your desire with, you know, the things where you're trying to be, as Dylan said so well, you know, you got to serve somebody. So 
who are you going to be in service to? You know, um, what, what kind of work are you going to do that will serve others? You know, so that that was something that the book taught me. That's great. And and sorry about the uh, the ringtone in there. That was my mom <laughs> calling in. <laughs> and I know you're a family man. And, and Rick, I haven't touched the book yet. Obviously, we just know that I just uh, received it. Um, is there there must be some uh, some paragraphs in there about your late father, correct? Indeed. Yeah. Because I, I understand from the last time we spoke, you just lost your father at that point, And you did relay to me that you're a very close family. Yeah. And, you know, in the end, of course, I had become my mom, my wife and I had become the principal caregivers for my dad. Yeah. Uh, and he made it to 92. So he had a pretty good run. Um, but, you know, yeah, the book talks about the not just my dad, you know, lost my mom, lost my brothers, like the nuclear family that I grew up in. I'm the right. only one left, you know. So there is a thing about uh, grief and uh, how how you deal with it and how you handle it. And I think the the in my life the hardest loss wasn't my dad; it was my younger brother Russ. Uh, but out of his uh, cancer and then his you know his dying, there was a lot of positive stuff that came out of it because he was really the guy that talked me into going. Well, you should get back yeah, with Triumph. That's right. I, I want you to. I want you to. You know make amends and build fences and, and get back with them because I would like your continuing life and your relationship to Triumph to be something that's almost like part of my legacy because I'm a huge Triumph fan and I'm your brother and I want to make that happen. And I was kind of going, you son of a, you're going to make, you're going to turn this around on me. You know? mm -hmm. um, but the book talks about that mm -hmm. and the dynamic, the emotional dynamics of that. Right. And you said you were, you, were, you taught, I believe you taught at Hummer college. I did. And you taught that many, I didn't realize it was that many years you taught the music program there. Yeah, I, I was on the advisory committee at the beginning for many years. And then the guy that ran the program at the time, Brian Lillis, was the guy that said, hey, you should come in here. You know, we have a music business course and nobody likes to teach it. Nobody's any good at it. And you should come in and teach it. And um, everybody in the in the course has to take it. So it's it's a tough because, you know, you end up having like 40 kids in third year in this class. But um, I, 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 you know, he smooched my ass enough that my head swelled up and I decided to go for it. So, I, you know, I, and I, once I was in there, I loved it. I loved the camaraderie of it, the collegiality yeah. of the incredibly talented people that are on that faculty, you know, musicians. And, and, and you know, the truth about jazz is, you can't really necessarily earn enough money to have a living. So they all end up having to sort of become teachers. But these are, you know, at the time it was, you know, I think one of the best jazz programs uh, in North America, you know, and um, those folks were s such, you know, gifted, talented people to be around. It was always a great pleasure. I, I liked, you know, being involved in curriculum committees and things like that because it was just, you were hanging with these tremendously gifted intelligent uh, uh uh insightful people and uh, i was going ah so this is what you know i mean not to put it, rock musicians down in any regard or even the guys that i'd worked with but it was just now you were with these people that were um they had an artistic kind of uh vision of life you know um and yet they were teachers, you know, but and I loved the whole thing about an academic environment. There's a pluralistic liberal. I mean, you know, a college education is a liberal education. And that liberality was something that it spoke to me on on deep levels, you know. Um, so, yeah. I, and I didn't realize it was a jazz program. And it's, had I known that, I would have come up with a s slick one liner. I never really got into jazz, Rick. I mean, I, I yeah. do know that, um, I think we talked about this the last time, um, a very special guitar player to me is, um, what's his name? From the Stray Cats. What the heck is his name? Brian Setzer. Yeah, I liked his, because he's he's really jazzy, right? Yes. Um, so what is it about jazz that you think appeals to some people and, and others not? Well, obviously, once jazz gets to a certain point, it starts to be very intellectually challenging. And right. some folks, when they go to music, they don't necessarily go to music for an intellectual challenge. They go there because they want recreation. They want enjoyment. They want entertainment, you know. Um, and I get that. I, hey, I played in a rock band that blew off flashpots, you know. Like, mm. 
I get I get it. You know, music sometimes is really just about having some fun and putting on a show. But I always liked the other side of it. There was always classical guitar pieces on Triumph Records and and then and little jazz tunes and stuff. And to me, jazz becomes sort of the ultimate challenge for a musician, you know, because right. it lives uh, you know, on a couple of levels. You can have very sophisticated charts that you've got to read uh, on a really high level. Yeah. That could be the jazz that you like. Uh, it could be jazz where the improvisation is happening at an extremely high level. Like people are communicating in a language that, you know, and I don't mean this to sound... Uh, derogatory in any sense, but you don't understand that language. Mm -hmm. These people are speaking a language that you just don't get, you know. So if you were sitting around, I don't know, you know, at a Bulgarian wedding and everybody was talking in Bulgarian, you'd be going, eh, I don't really get this. Uh, I'm not really into it, you know. Yeah. So, I, you know, uh, I, I get that. I totally get that. Uh, and I think jazz musicians understand, too, that the more that you get into it and the, and the deeper you go, the less and less you're going to have a public for it. You know, I mean, jazz and classical is already, and, you know, I don't know the absolute up-to-date things, but it's it's less than 3% of the global market for music. Right. And and that's jazz and classical. They didn't use to combine them, but now they do because it's shrinking. It's getting smaller and smaller all the time because, you know, what happens now is people go to music and in big numbers, rap and hip-hop dominates. And, you know, and Taylor Swift, is getting apparently the NFL is now crazy about her, you yeah. know, like, like that's the kind of stuff that is making the whole world sing now or dance or what I mean, sing and dance is probably that's always been a part of it. I remember being a kid and there would be like uh, American Bandstand, and you know, Dick Clark would be with his microphone and walk up to these teenage kids and stick the mic and go, So, well, you know, what do you think of this song? What, what kind of grade would you give this song? And you go, Who made these teenagers music critics, right? But yeah. of course, that's what that's what media does, and social media does it to it, to an even stronger degree. But anyways, he pulled the mic, and they would go, "Well, I'm going to give it a nine out of ten, Dick, because man, you can really dance to that." And I go, "Well, music doesn't necessarily just have to be something you can dance to, right. because I grew up singing in church choirs and listening to classical music, and uh, you know, I liked music of all kinds, you know. And when I played rock, I kind of wanted rock to have that kind of open-mindedness too, not necessarily the other guys in my band, they would go, Rick, I think you're you're off on a tangent here, Emmett. Why don't you pull it back a little here? Let's let's find the groove that the whole world likes to, you know. Yeah. So anyhow, yeah. there you go. So actually you, you brought up uh classical. I love classical, but like you said, you can't necessarily dance to it, but I like it. But what I'm taking out of this whole thing is you're saying that the NFL and their fans cannot be with intellectual music, right? That's why they got Taylor Swift. <laughs> I don't think. Oh it's no, it. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying, saying it. I'm just saying that you know <laughs> that if they if they can get reaction shots of the most you know uh, yeah uh, powerful and and uh, uh, and uh, 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 beloved woman in pop, eye friendly uh, yeah. right now. When when yeah when the Kansas City Chiefs score a touchdown, then I guess they're going to do it. You know why wouldn't they? You know um, yeah. And look, I, I have you seen the Taylor Swift thing that's on Netflix? Or you know I what? I haven't seen anything. I all I know about Taylor Swift, and this is the truth, that she's the biggest thing right now. And she did a duet with Def Leppard years ago. That's all I know. Oh. And that oh. and that Trudeau Trudeau kind of figures she's more important than um a lot of things going on in Canada and he wants to get her here. So he tweeted about her. That's all I know. Okay. Well, if you watch the thing, I think you would uh, come to the, I think everybody would come to the conclusion that that is a smart woman. That is a, a talented, creative person that really does understand that she's at the center of something that inevitably you can't control. I mean, you know, even in my own, humble little memoir i'm talking about the fact that there's things that happen in the music business that you can't control it. it it goes beyond your control you write a song and it goes out there and it's out in the world and things can start to happen and you can't control them and you're an idiot if you think you can you have to you have to come to terms with it in a way that you're going no 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 and taylor swift is I, I think she's doing a, an, an admirable, great job of being Taylor Swift. And, you know, and But I used to teach this in my uh, business classes all the time. I would say, look, Madonna, that woman's got a spine made out of tempered steel. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and if you want to be like Beyonce, you got to be able to survive from the changing of the guard in pop music. It happens every three or four years now where but these people survive it and they thrive. How do you make that happen? Like uh, the, the building of dynasties takes uh, an awful lot of willpower, an awful lot of uh, intelligence. And, and uh, anyways, um yeah, yeah, I, I I admire her. Like, not like I sit and listen to her music all the time, but, but <laughs> I certainly I admire somebody that can become the king or queen of pop. Hey, that's good for you. Her perseverance and her strength for sure. Um, so basically, um, and this is really a good information for me because I thought that the uh, the book was generally surrounding you know you kind of setting the record straight, but you're saying that's only about a uh, one small percentage so the book is well-rounded what are you doing these days rick um, um do you have any more music coming out are you working on any projects any shows coming up for the uh, viewers yeah i'm crazy busy uh which i thought i'd retired and apparently not um i started uh, fiddling around. i got a guitar made i'm going to show you this guitar i had this custom made and and it's a telecaster but it's it's got gibson les paul specs like at the bridge height and the, oh, wow. the scale length so this was made and I, st- I started getting into this guitar in a big way i wrote i've written 10 pieces and i'm, I'm putting out an album called 10 telecaster tales oh, and wow. i'm writing stories about the 10 pieces and about the guy that wrote them and about the guitar itself and so you know there'll be another book at some point it might be a uh, just a short one but um that will accompany the album when it comes out but there, i haven't started the recording yet I, I got intimate with the guitar and then I really wanted to do this in an old school way so that I would have a complete command of the pieces before I started to record them. Part of that was because I was wanting to be old school and see if I could get from A to Z of the piece without having to use a digital edit, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, it may, it may never happen, but that's a kind of an old school thing. And I'm thinking that's, that's the influence of all those jazz people. You know, that's how they do things. You know, they fly by the seat of their pants and, and you know, they don't do multiple takes and do edits. You know, they, they make it happen live, you know. Um, so that's that's one of the things that's going down. I, I'm Ernest, you're going to be happy to hear. I'm going to play a live gig again. I'm going to Sweden for Sweden. New Year's. Yeah. And that's because the Canadian junior hockey, they, they, the every four years they have a championship. Yeah. So, through a, a friend of mine, I met the guy that puts together the tour packages for all the families and friends that go to watch these well, hockey tournaments, yeah. right? So, so it's in Gothenburg, Sweden. Okay. And uh, my wife and I are going to fly on over and I'm going to be sitting in with the band. So I've booked rehearsals with them and stuff because they're going to do covers. of some, they, they do Canadian cover songs for their New Year's party for all of these folks. Yeah, that which are band, the what band are you talking about? Well, they're called the Canadian Cover Crew. Okay. Okay. I didn't hear. And, and they do they do YouTube videos. People could go and find little because I did one where I, I did uh, Eleanor Rigby by the Beatles with a string quartet for for oh, this wow. guy. Yeah, and and he said, "Do you want a string quartet in Sweden?" And I went, "That would be awesome." Yeah, and he goes, "You want to do like, like hold on and magic power and lay it on the line?" And if you want, we can change the keys and rewrite the. And I went, "That would be awesome." Yeah. So, you know, I'm looking forward to having a lot of fun. It'll be a huge challenge. But, um, yeah, like it, Magic Power used to be in the key of D. It's now living in the key of A. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, but, you know, it's going to have some strings and some horns and who knows. You know, so it should be fun. So I'm doing that. What else am I? Oh, I got, I got a compilation album coming out. I got all of my masters back from the albums I made after I left Triumph. So 90 to 95, I made three albums uh, and I got the rights back. So they got remastered, and then they, they made me search around and find a couple of old demos from that time period. So uh, an album CD package thing is coming out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Music okay. in Motion is the name of the company, and Rock Paper Merch is the name of the website where people can find it. And, um, yeah, so that album's coming out, and, uh, you know, in time for Christmas. Not in time for Halloween, but in time for Christmas. Oh, what and, about in time for um, American Thanksgiving? That's in the middle of November. Or is it yeah, not? yeah, yeah. Let's let's hope. Let, so wow, you hope. yeah, you got a lot of stuff going on. Um, that's just yeah. great. But I really, I really want to focus in on because I really am interested in this. I'm a hockey fan as well. So 
Are you going to be playing like during the World Juniors, like part of the World Juniors? Is that how it is? Or are you going to be at the same time there playing these shows? No, I'm I'm part of it. So so this is how it happens, right? Oh wow! Like the the team is playing these games in an arena. The re- yeah. you know well in several arenas, but there's one sort of central one yeah. where there's like a, a convention center. So there's a there's a hotel that's attached to it, and then there's a um, a place where you can, so you don't even have to go outdoors to get to the rink. You can go through these corridors and get yeah. to the hockey rink. Like it's a big, a big deal, right? And mm-hmm. then there's a place where you can go where they have a, a big concert. And so the, when the Canadians, all the families, the moms and the dads and the cousins and the girlfriends, and, and they're all looking for something to do for New Year's, like the game happens during the day, but yeah. then what's going to happen during the night? Well, this guy puts a band together and they play cover tunes of like, old lighthouse songs and uh old pagliero tunes and like it's canadiana wow uh, the, but they also do other stuff too where there's cover songs of earth wind and fire and you know party songs and uh no no and, we, and, we, we just want the triumph tunes so you're going to be doing yeah. some triumph tunes yeah yeah so that is... yeah, that, and I, i'm not exactly sure how it'll happen i don't know if they'll spread them out or if they put them together as like a little sort of you know, uh, and now here's our guest artist, Rick Emmett, and he's going to yeah. sing a triumph set, or if they just kind of, and once I'm out there, I'll just sit in with the band and, and play on all the other tunes too, and just be a side man in the band, you know, and it's a good band. They got Larry Gowan's brother, Terrence, is playing oh, bass. Okay. Yeah. yeah and and uh, Bob McAlpine's playing guitar. Uh, Mike Shotton is the drummer, and he sings some of the stuff. They got Gavin Hope singing some, some of the tunes. He, there's one where he does like, like a, I played on it. You can find the uh, video on YouTube. A Delphonic song. Uh, sure. Didn't I blow your mind this time? Didn't I? Didn't I blow your mind this time? Didn't I? Like, and there's a sitar guitar. So I'm playing, like, I'm taking a sitar guitar pedal with me to Sweden so that I can play that. Sitar, people, uh, is a guitar that sounds like um, uh, Bad Banjo. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, it just, but I mean, no, it has a twang to it, right? It got used on tons and tons. Of, you remember, uh, give me a ticket for an airplane. Ain't got time to take a fast. Right? Yeah, yeah. It was called The Letter by the Box Ops. And it had beer, mom, beer, mom. It had this, <laughs> you know, sitar guitar thing. Lots and lots of hits had them, you know. I'm trying to think. There was a Steely Dan one, too. Anyways, you know. That's, tons that's of, awesome, Rick. I love those. Yeah. Near, 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 near. Yeah, I um, wait. I have one right here. This is the one I used on the records. I don't oh, know wow. if we're going to be able to hear it or not. This. No, we can't hear it. But if you do, yeah, the, you know why? Near, near, near now, we can hear it. The, these Zoom things—they make it so that live music can't go through it. That's I know I mean. because it's copyright and all that nonsense, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyways, see, there's the sitar guitar. That's an that's awesome. A, wow, that's baby. Baby Sitar, there it is. That I think is awesome. The guy that originally invented it was name was Vinnie Bell, and they for the original ones were called the Coral Electric Sitar Guitar, and it had a bunch of drone strings too. This one just has the strings going over a bridge that makes it have that near buzzy kind of sound. It kind of reminds me the body, anyways, of a guitar. Maybe I think maybe I've seen Paul McCartney with. I don't know. Well, McCartney had a Hofner bass, like the Beatle bass. It didn't really have horns. It was rounded like a violin. The, yeah. the, that's also reminiscent of sort of Vox. There was a Brian Jones of the Stones used yeah. to play a kind of a weird shaped Vox guitar that didn't have any horns on it or bouts is what we guitar players call them. <laughs> oh, wow. No, that's beautiful. Yeah. And you, you got them all in... Uh pristine condition because i don't think uh, you thought you're going to be bringing up the sitar so do you have somebody you hire to come in and polish them every day or <laughs> or do you do that no they're... no no you're looking at the guy that polishes them <laughs> you know, okay. and feels guilty when they don't get played often enough and get too much dust on them and yeah mm-hmm. but um that's this this is pretty much my life right here Ernest. you know this oh, is i know for you. yeah um, i know that's that's only about a half of your guitars, correct? This, well, there's about another half dozen that are around the room in different places, but this is pretty much it. I'm down to about 48, or 48 or okay. 49. You know, it depends what you count as a guitar, because I have a couple in the basement that were the first 
acoustic I ever owned and the first electric I ever owned. Okay. And they don't have strings on them, and they're just hanging on the wall, kind of over my workbench. And you know, but for rainy you know, day. Yeah, well, there's still guitars. You know, maybe at some point, I, there's a you know, as you get older and you write your memoir and these things, you start to think, what's going to happen to these things when I kick the bucket? You know. And then I go, maybe I should give the old ones to like the music museum in Calgary. They might not put them on display, but they might keep them, you know, in an archive somewhere. And then at any point in time, if there was ever any research or need, yeah. you know, those kinds of places exist now. Universities do that where mm -hmm. you can archive stuff with them. I think they give you a tax credit. <laughs> yeah, know, maybe. Like, You're lucky. Yeah. Well, for yeah, Canadians, I don't know, but the Americans would. Um, yeah. No, I think I think uh, uh, for sure the U of T does it, and, okay. and there's a music, there's a music museum out in Calgary, and I think they're affiliated with either the University of Calgary or somebody out there, and I think they they also do it. And I've heard stories of people where, you know, the two inch, twenty four track ta tapes that you would that people would record in back yeah. in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, after a while. People don't want to have to, uh, you know, keep those anymore. So what you can do is you donate them to these university programs. They will digitize the stuff. So then you can get digital stuff from your original two-inch masters. Right. But your your two-inch masters are now being safely taken care of by somebody else. Yeah. But as an artist, you can access it. Um, so it's it's kind of like, that's a beautiful idea. Like, what yeah, a great idea. Worry. But yeah. the storage of them, right? Yeah, preserves history in a way, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but you can still get access to it if you, if you want it or need it. I know when Banger did the Triumph documentary, yeah. they filled out paperwork and they were able to access stuff that Triumph had already given or donated or however that works. I you know I don't know, um, but in order to create some of the stuff, they they were accessing the original two inch 24 inch tapes and going hey rick you okay if we use this i go it's not mine it belonged to triumph so yeah, yeah. go ahead i signed that off last year um before i let you go rick i mean this was really great that you gave me the info about the world juniors i mean that is just great great news as well as the book everybody can get it at ecw um as well as your fine book stores but i'd be remiss if i forgot to ask you for the viewers, tell us one funny story about, um, let's say, pyrotechnics and uh, and triumph. Funny stories. Well, because when they happen, they're not funny. You know, you, you they only become funny after years of getting over the trauma. But <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell one. This is a little talking out of school, but no, I'm going to tell two because yes. the first bad mishap that ever happened with pyro was uh, we were playing the bars in the early days. So this would have literally probably been the winter of 1975, 76. And we were playing a place in Toronto called the Piccadilly Tube, which was uh, young and Dundas in a basement kind of thing. And it, it designed so that it looked like a, a London uh, subway tube station, right? right. Piccadilly Tube. And um, we had become kind of like, uh, we'd play there and then they would invite us back because we, they'd done so well and they, they kept wanting us to come back. And Gil would do a shtick where he got like from a, a magic store, he'd bought in flash paper. So flash paper kind of looked like little things that they were like uh, what you'd roll a, a joint with, you know, like paper, but it was thin. But if you touched it to anything, uh, you know, that was lit, boom, there'd be this little ball of fire. Right. Right. So he would take two or three of those papers and roll up a bunch of gunpowder flash powder in in a little roll so it was like a little kind of cigarette and then he would be doing a rap sitting at the drums and maybe even playing boom 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 and you know talking about something and then the, the roadies would hand him this thing like a little mini cigar and there was a lit cigarette that was taped to the side of the snare drum and then he would do this thing where he would go you know, blah, 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 ball of fire or whatever he was going to say. And then he would touch the thing and throw his hand into the air and a ball of fire would go boom, like in front of his face. Right? right. But the timing had to be just right. And he probably had a few beers that night, you know. <laughs> so he touched the thing and before he could get rid of it, it just all went up in his hand. So his hand had like, you know, second degree burns <laughs> by his entire hand. 
So, you know, we had to kind of cut the show short. And then he was doing a thing where he got a bucket of ice water and he was putting his hand in the bucket of ice water, pulling it out, playing, you know, a little bit, but then having to stick his hand back in the bucket of water to, you know, to keep his hand numb. And he went, you know, it's it's not that bad, but it's bad. This blistering will eventually peel off and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, just slather it in Vaseline and, mm. you know, uh, don't touch anything. Well, we're going to be playing the next night. <laughs> and so he comes and he's got a rubber glove. I'm not making this up. The bucket of ice, <laughs> ice water. And he slathered his hand in oil, like in Vaseline, and then rubber glove. And then glove that into the bucket of water until it's so numb that he can't feel it. And now he's playing. And when he can't, he sticks his hand in the bucket and he keeps playing with one hand, <laughs> like kick and snare. So there's no there's no uh, cymbal crashes or high act. And he sings he's, like he's still singing his song. <laughs> like I think back on it now and I go, you you have to be you know, twenty four years old and just stupid. <laughs> To do you this, a couple of beer in you, yeah. Oh, no kid, yeah, more than a couple. So that was the first story. Now the second story, That's real awesome. quick. We're playing Hamilton, and it's a theater that we kind of last minute sort of put this thing together because the Americans are sending some record company people to come up to see the band, but we didn't really have a gig, and they wanted to come up and see the band, and it was like going to be a Thursday. I, I don't remember, but so we kind of get this theater thing put together, and we're going to go play with it. Put the tickets up for sale, and. And so we're playing this small theater in Hamilton. And um, it, because it's kind of last minute and it's slapdash and it's a pretty small little stage, at a certain point, Levine is doing a rap at the front. And I, I don't know. Do, 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 do you remember what Mike Levine kind of looked like? Long, oh, long yeah, yeah, yeah. He looked like, like Jesus. Like, yeah. And he had pretty long hair in many parts of his body. So he was, yeah. you know, hairy chest, hairy arms. Yeah. So he he's doing a rap at the front of the stage and he's got his arm extended and a flash plot is, goes off. It's not supposed to, but it goes off and there's too much sort of flash powder in it. So when it comes up, it's still kind of burning in the smoke and it burns off all the hair on his arm. No. Right. Way. Doesn't doesn't actually burn his skin, but it burnt like the hair on his arm is like he's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, it's like patting his arm to put out the smoke he fired that's on his arm. So we finish the song and when we go up and it's a long little narrow staircase up to a dressing room. And when when I'm a delay, I can't remember why I got delayed, but I'm delayed coming up the stairs after and I can hear beer bottles smashing. And so I come up into the dressing room and Levine is so angry and he's got so much adrenaline from the fact that he nearly got blown up. Yeah, that he's taking empty beer bottles and he's just yelling and swearing at the roadies and swearing at the theater and, and smashing these beer bottles into the wall. And I'm going, oh, I think I better steer clear of him for a little. <laughs> like, <laughs> clearly, he's upset. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So two guys in the band had uh, left hand or arm issues with pyrotechnics. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know if Mike's was left or right, to be okay. honest. I, I'm I'm using my left because I'm left-handed, and so that's what I. Oh, I think okay. for Gil, I'm pretty sure. What is the? Yeah, I think the the snare uh, for a right-handed guy is, is is your left hand, right? I I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I think it is. So I think I think it was that hand. I don't know. You re interview him sometime and ask him. <laughs> yeah, I have, but I will interview him again and ask him that. So is it fair to say maybe there's a part of the reason why you left the band was because you thought that you know. Uh, three is a chart what is that saying um two oh no is, no yeah. I'm not, you're not saying you left because you're afraid two's company there. three's a charm no no <laughs> two's company three's a crowd no, yeah third time a charm. no we no. can there's many things that have three in them buddy no um uh, i got blown up twice i didn't tell you those stories they're oh, in no, the book I, I like to hear yeah, people will have to read the book to for to get to the stories where i got they're in the book up. here yeah oh yeah there's two of them yeah there it is look at that perfect god all right. Hey, thanks again, Rick. Uh, oh, last thing. What's the opposite of unsubscribe? Uh, subscribe. Hey, everybody do as the great Rick Emmett says and subscribe to the channel for these great interviews. Make sure you get a copy of Laid on the Line and find bookstores anywhere. If they don't have it, harass them. Make sure they get it. 
or go to ECW. Once again, thanks. It's been a pleasure, Rick. Thanks for the stories. Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. Thank you.